Let me introduce to you one of the most powerful and recognizable voices in Portland, the co-founder and inspiration for Black Heroes Matter, my friend, David Walker. I'm honored to be here speaking at the Creative Conference. I was at the second Creative Conference, which I think was in 90, who can back me up, 95? Was it 90? Was it something like that. Um, I will confess now, I snuck in. Um, I made my own badge because I couldn't afford it at the time. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> yes, that's very true. Um, but I was so desperate to go, I was so desperate to um, meet people and to hear what was going on that I essentially broke the law. Um, at, that con at that conference, um, interestingly enough, I met Sean Levy, who is one of the speakers later uh, this afternoon, who became a good friend of mine and gave me some of the best advice. Uh, Sean was working at the Oregonian at the time, I was working at the Willamette Week at the time, oh, excuse me, Willamette Week. They get very upset if you put the in front of it. Um, and I was, I was feeling very antsy. I, I, I wanted to do more than just uh, be a journalist or a film critic or something like that. And, and Sean said, you should write a book. And I was like, I, I can't write a book, that's impossible. And, and Sean actually explained to me the mathematics of writing a book. And it was the, the word count that you could achieve in a day, in a week, in a month. And he was like, and if you do this, you'll write a book. And like that stuck with me. And so I, I wrote a book. Like how hard is it to do, right? Um, I wrote my first work of fiction. Uh, conversely, Scott Alley is someone that I've also known for, um, I knew of for many years uh, when he was self-publishing. He had his own comic publishing company. Um, I was just getting publishing, doing my own publishing. and sort of knew of each other but didn't meet. We'd see each other on the street and kind of do that nod. And, um, but most recently, he was my editor at Dark Horse and it was an amazing experience. Not always the easiest ex experience and we'll get into some of that in my, when my presentation really gets started. Um, I'm not originally from Portland but I moved here in 1980 which means I've been here longer than probably half the people in this room and probably longer than half the people in this room have been alive. Um, <laughs> I went to high school out at Madison on Northeast 82nd Avenue. Don't hold that against me um, because I survived that experience. I knew from a really early age that, and when I say really early age, we're talking three, four years old, that I wanted to do something. I knew that I wanted to make comic books or make TV or make movies. I was fascinated with, with any sort of thing that was, was visual. Um, I started drawing and writing my own comics at a very early age. Unfortunately, none of those still exist. Or maybe it's fortunately none of them still exist because they were, they were quite terrible. Uh, but I was six at the time, so you can't really hold that against me. Um, in high school, I don't know if they still do this, the, the career aptitude test. Did any of you have to take a career aptitude test? It tells you what you're going to be when you grow up, right? <laughs> How many, by show of hands, please, how many of you took that? Okay. Wow, that's quite a few of you. So I took the career aptitude test twice. My freshman year in high school, no, it was eighth grade, excuse me, um, I, it told me that I was, I was best qualified to be an FBI special agent. <laughs> I suspect I must have lied on that questionnaire or something. I, I, was, I was very into James Bond films at the time. The next year, my freshman year in high school, I was told, this is no lie, that I was most qualified to be a fry cook. So I went from FBI special agent to fry cook in, in less than a year. Um, and I was sort of like, fry cook? Well, that might not be that bad, but I think I can do more with my life. Um, and you know, back then, there was all this pressure on, what are you going to be? What are you going to be? What are you going to do? And so I was like, well, you know, the only thing that I like to do is, is go to the movies and read comic books. So I'm going to create comic books. That's what I decided my freshman year in high school. And that was moving forward. And so consequently, I didn't pay much attention in school because you don't need to do that to, you know, make comic books. You just read comic books all day long. Um, I barely graduated high school. Um, and then I went to art school immediately following high school where I discovered Lo and behold, I actually did suck as an artist. Um, 
it's, and when I mean artist, I mean a person who picks up some sort of drawing utensil and draws. I'm terrible at that. Um, but if you sign your name on that line that says, I will pay for this at some point, as in the student loans, they'll let you into art school, no problem. <laughs> um, so it took about two and a half, three years at art school before I realized that I was never going to be a comic book artist. Um, but during that process, I started writing a lot. And I started to realize that, oh, maybe I could do something with writing. Um, I was going to, at the time I was going to School of Visual Arts, and I lived in a building on 34th Street that was, uh, <laughs> wow, this is crazy. Um, it, was, it was on the corner of 34th and 9th, and it was a multi-use living facility. The bottom floors were an international youth hostel, so like students from abroad would live there. There was five or six floors that was student housing for School of Visual Arts and I believe Pratt. And then the upper uh, stores were the Bellevue outpatient psychiatric housing, right? <laughs> it was one of the craziest places to live. And uh, the corner of the building that I lived in was all School of Visual Arts students. For some reason, I lived in a corner building with all the film majors. And they thought I was just a film student who somehow wasn't in any of the classes with them. <laughs> and, um, and I became really good friends with a guy named Carlo Giardina. And one day he said to me, he said, um, how come I never see you in any of our classes? Like, you're a film major and you're not in any of the classes. And I was like, no, I'm an illustration major. And he was like, really? And then I showed him some of my illustrations and he was like, yeah, dude, you should be a film major. <laughs> um, <laughs> Shortly after that, I dropped out of school um, and decided, well, maybe film is where I'm going to go, but I don't know how to do it. I'm already massively in debt. So I just started writing because I figured if you wrote enough, sooner or later you were, I was going to figure out where I needed to be and what I needed to do. This was a very difficult time for me. I was in my early 20s. Uh, I'm, how many of you are in your early 20s, if you don't mind admitting that? I won't hold it against you. OK, there's not too many of you. Wow. Um, so you're probably at that really impatient, insecure, when's it going to happen? It's not happening fast enough, right? Now, how many of you in your 30s and feel that same way? OK. In your 40s and feel that way? OK, you see a pattern developing here? <laughs> it never changes. The only thing that changes is if you, can if you change and adjust your feelings. You learn how to be a little bit more patient, which I'll get into in a little bit. Um, so I, I, I messed around with film for a long time, uh, and that was why I snuck into that creative conference that first time. It was how I met Sean. I was working on a documentary and, um, and spent a lot of time in, in trying to break into film. Here in Portland in the 90s was a very interesting time because th there was a very brief window in the early 90s where it seemed like, wow, everything is going to happen. There's, we're we're going to start getting more work, and then it sort of went away. Um, and, and the whole time, I realized that if I want to make movies and I'm not making them, I better do something else. And that was what started pushing me towards doing other types of writing. I was writing a lot of, like, really bizarre rambling reviews of films. I was doing a ton of film research for a documentary. And that led me to starting my own publication. Uh, everybody was doing it back in the 90s, before the internet, before blogs and podcasts and all that sort of stuff. People were just self-publishing. They were, uh, some people were publishing zines. I wanted more than a zine, I wanted a magazine, right? Like a zine just sounds like Eh, it's kind of a magazine, but it's not really. It's a thing that you keep like by your toilet, but you don't really do anything <laughs> with it. Um, I wanted a magazine. I set out to do that. I did that. Um, and through that, a, a tremendous amount of opportunities happened. And, and there's a point to this story, was that <clears throat> I was so impatient for the things that I wanted creatively, and they weren't coming fast enough, so I found other things creatively to do. I found that if I worked on maybe two or three things at a time, but they weren't the exact same thing, 
So I wasn't trying to get three films produced at the same time, because that was just plain silly. I couldn't get one produced, so why should I try to do three? That's three times the heartbreak. What I started doing was, was diversifying in my creativity, and I, and I locked onto something that really worked, and that was I, I created my own publication. I wrote probably 95% of everything. Um, I did all the design, all the layout. It was kind of a fool's errand, but, um, but at the end of the day, it opened up a tremendous amount of doors. And then I ended up at Willamette Week, um, and I was there for seven years. Concurrently, for five of those years, I ran a film festival for them. And every day, or not every day, about three, four days a week, I would see Sean Levy at uh, screenings. And we would both look at each other, and we would just, you know, we're sitting there at Flintstones in Viva Rock Vegas, and we're going, there has to be more to life than this, right? Um, and Sean had written a couple books, and to me, I was just in awe of that concept that someone could string together more than 1,000 words at a time or more than 2,000 words at a time. And so I started exploring and thinking about what I wanted to do. And, and then I had a chance encounter, and this chance encounter never would have happened if I hadn't taken the job at the newspaper, which was a form of creativity in, it, in and of itself, but it wasn't allowing me to do what I wanted to do. And I don't tell this story that often in public, but um, Will Eisner is considered, the best way to put it, he is to comics what Orson Welles is to film. The, the entire language of comics, graphic novels, sequential art, whatever you want to call it, the entire language of what it is and how it's done was essentially either written or co-written by Will Eisner. And I got a call, Will Eisner was in town, this was in 2000 or 2001, he was in town for an event, and I got a call from Diana Schutz, who at the time was an editor at Dark Horse, who knew me from my publication, Badass Mofo, knew that I was working at the Willamette Week, and said, hey, would you interview Will? Nobody from the press wants to interview Will. And I was like, who doesn't want to interview Will Eisner? Will Eisner is the reason I went to School of Visual Arts. Will Eisner is the reason I, went into, I wanted to get into comics. So I agreed to interview Will, and, uh, and after the interview, Will said, and, and, and let me go backtrack. I don't know if any of you ever conducted interviews or not. Um, you know when somebody does not want to be interviewed, right? <laughs> especially if it's a face-to-face -face interview. And, and Will did not want to be interviewed, right? He just didn't want it. And I'm, ex I'm ecstatic. I'm like the totally goofy fanboy. I, the journalist has left the room, right? <laughs> and uh, so after the interview, Will says to me, wow, that was a, an amazing interview. He goes, I've never been interviewed by anyone who knows as much about the industry as you do. And I was like, oh, thanks. And I just casually said, you know, I, I always wanted to make comics when I was a kid and even in college. And, and he said, well, why'd, why'd you quit? And I said, it just never worked out. And I, you know, got this, I got a good career now. And, and honestly, I'm, I'm a little too old. I was about 35 at the time. <laughs> and Will was about 85 at the time. <laughs> and he looked at me and he said, you're too what? And he was like, if this is what you want, there's no such thing as too old. And it stuck with me. I mean, it stuck with me hard. And, uh, and so I decided I'm going to do it. And, and so I spent several years really trying to get into comics, which is a, an incredibly difficult thing to do if you don't draw, which leads us to where we are right now. Um, let's see if this thing works. Yes, what do you do for a living? That's the question. I go to a party, I go anywhere I go, people ask me what I do for a living. I've gotten to the point where I stop lying um, and I just openly admit it. And it's not that I'm lying out of shame, I'm lying because when I say I write comics, this is the response I get from everyone. <laughs> it is... I think if I told people that I was studying epigenetics, they might go, what's that? But for something that people are so aware of, they really don't understand what it means to write comic books. So I sort of go into an explanation. These are some pages that I wrote, and it just sort of gives you an example, a, a visual cue of what comics look like, because I realize that some people might not be aware of them. Some people still don't read them, even though they, they are, they're well, they're not quite everywhere like they used to be. And, uh, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, 
So then they ask me, well, if you write comics, what exactly does that mean? They, they always say, so let me get this straight. You put those little words in the balloons, right? And I go, no, there's a little bit more to it. <laughs> and they go, OK, so, so the words in the balloons, you put them there. And then I say, no, there's a little bit more to it. And then they say, OK, but so there's those words on the page. And you put them there. And I go, no, there's a little bit more to it. <clears throat> and then I try to explain a comic book is made up of a series of scenes, much like a movie or a television show or even a novel, and that those scenes are broken down into individual moments in space and time, and that within those moments, those are called panels. And what I do as writers, I describe that panel. I describe who's in the panel, what's going on in the panel. Sometimes I might even suggest the shot. And then there's also the dialogue. And right here on the screen, you see an example of two different panels back to back. They're part of the same story, one right after the other. And I, and I think that that's a pretty good explanation as to what I do. And this is the response that I get. <laughs> and it's, I become sort of a recluse. I don't get out much. And this is the reason why. Because trying to explain what you do when nobody understands it is, um, as a creative person, is very frustrating. Because you spend all this time and energy in a medium, in my case, comics, that I love. Okay? I've been, I, I literally learned how to read by reading comic books. Other kids were reading Dr. Seuss books. I learned how to read with comic books. It's the most important medium in my life. And for people to not understand what I do drives me absolutely crazy. I'm constantly trying to explain it, and they don't quite get it, but I think I've got it figured out here. So here we have a page that I wrote. And, but this is not the original page. This is the final page. What we see on it here is all of the art. We see the lettering. And again, I did more than write the little words that are in the bubbles. But so what I want to do is I want to take you through the creative process of how a comic book is created. But we're going to go backwards. So this is what the final page of a comic book looks like. By the way, if some of you are wondering what the difference between a comic book and a graphic novel is, the difference between a comic book and a graphic novel is this. A graphic novel, you generally tend to need a bookmark because it's longer than a comic book. That's the only difference, is the length. Um, and if there are any questions, there'll be time afterwards. So this is the final page of a comic. Um, and then what we have here is, again, going in reverse order. What we see over on my left, which would be your, I don't know. I'm not even going to try directions here, um, is we see the art in its colored format. Uh, and on the, next to that, we see just the inked pencil, the, the inked artwork. Um, colors come second to last. Letters come very last, although that used to not be how the production process worked, but that's an aside that I can tell you in the lobby some other time. Okay. This is the penciled page. This is the, the beginning of the transformation that takes place. And I'm going to get into the transformation in a second. But again, this is not the page. This right here is the page. This is what it all starts as. It all starts as a series of shots and ideas and dialogue and descriptions that, that I come up with. And, and I come up with it and then I share it with my team. And I always talk about it as my scripts are letters to my collaborators, OK? A lot of it is suggestion. A lot of it is, is guidance. But I always leave it open to interpretation. And that interpretation um, will change depending on the artist that you're working with. So, so this, again, is the page we were just looking at. Um, and here we have a comparison side by side. We have the original script as I wrote it, and you have the original page, or the, the art. The art is a translation. The art is no different in my mind than if someone were to take my text, which is written in English, full of uh, typos and bad grammar and all kinds of things like that, and simply translated it to another language. They could translate it to Portuguese. They could translate it to ancient Aramaic. They could translate it to some language none of us have ever heard of. What we're seeing next to it is just a translation of my words into another language, the visual language. In comics, 
your scripts, you're lucky if 35% of the words that you actually write show up on the page. They show up in the form of dialogue. That dialogue is often changed, which I'll also get into in just a moment. Um, the script changes, as in everything changes in translation. If you notice this comparison, the thing that you'll notice, or you may not notice, is that my script is a four-panel page. But Ivan, my artist, Ivan Rice, who lives in, in Brazil, um, he opted to turn it into a five-panel page. And that's his discretion. That's, it actually is a major improvement. Um, it means that then I have to begin changing what I wrote. Sometimes it's a drastic change, sometimes it's not a drastic change. So what we look at here is, is where he deviated from my script. Um, the first panel is exactly as I drew it, is exactly as I wrote it. And then the second panel, he figured it would look better if he divided it into two. And, you know, first off, Ivan's been drawing comics forever and he's a master of the craft. So the last thing I'm gonna do is go, hey man, you changed my script, you need to go back, because that third panel where Shazam and Cyborg and Batman and Wonder Woman are surrounded by those evil creatures, man, that sucks, I didn't write that. <laughs> and again, I didn't write that, okay? But I did write that, you know, that there was a confrontation going on, and, and Ivan, being a storyteller, just the same as myself, only using a completely different language, recognized an opportunity to build on that story, which is what he did. Um, and to me, that's the greatest part of comics, right? The greatest part of comics is that you're never 100% sure as a writer what you're going to get back from the artist, but most of the time what you get back is better than what you wrote. Um, so here we have another example. This is uh, a book that I was, I was writing for Marvel called Occupy Avengers. It's very, very simple, uh, a very simple scene. But as again, again you can see, um, this is a five panel scene that Gabriel Walta drew as six panels. And I'm not 100% sure why he drew it this way. Um, I never visualized it this way. And I'll get into the, visual, the visualization process in just a moment. Um, I wrote what I thought was a compelling scene and every issue that Gabriel and I worked on, almost every single page, he did not draw what I wrote. <laughs> he drew, drew really close to what I wrote, but he always drew something better. And I would look at the pages, even before the lettering was on it, and I would go, he made it better. By, by the time you see the art, you know your script well enough that you, you, you figure out. Um, and I would just always look at a script that I got back from Gabriel in the visual interpretation and look at it and go to my script and go five panels, he did six, okay, I need to rewrite this, which is what you're constantly doing. And you usually only have about 12 hours to do it, but that's another story for in and of itself. Um, so here we have another look at, uh, this, is, this is what a comic book page looks like before you see it. Uh, and this is another scene from that same book, maybe even the same issue that Gabriel drew. You'll notice that there's 15 uh, panels in the description on this page. And then this is the page as it looks. And, and what I want to point out, part of the reason I brought this up was for two reasons, was because they always say, by they, I mean everybody, whenever there's an action sequence in comics, they always go, oh my God, the artist is such an amazing storyteller. They got this action down so well, and da da da. And as a writer, you have to put your ego in check when really you're screaming, I wrote that action scene, right? Um, people who understand the writing of comics always make the assumption that we as writers write those talking head scenes like the ones I showed earlier, but that we can't write the action and that the artist is the one responsible for the action. But I wanted to show you that this page is not, this is a two page spread of nothing but action. And this is how it translates. This is what it ends up looking like. Um, there's, there's, I'm not gonna say there's nothing on this page that I didn't write because I wrote a 15 panel scene spread out over two pages and Gabriel somehow managed to turn it into an 18 panel scene with I think four panels that I don't even know where they came from. Um, but he figured Ah, it'll look better this way. And it did. It took me about two hours to figure out how to rewrite this sequence. Um, 
but I, I got it rewritten, and I think that it, it, it stands out as an amazing um, achievement in terms of what comics can do and what comics can be. Um, and so, what's the next slide? I can't remember. Okay, so this is another example of, of what we do, and this is getting into the visual component of it. Um, because again, and if I seem bitter at all, it's, you do get pretty bitter early on in comics for a whole host of reasons, but one of them is because nobody understands what you do, right? Um, I think the second most important part of being a comic book writer, if you do not draw, is to understand the visual dynamic of comics. If you do not understand the visual dynamic of comics, I teach at Portland State part-time. My first day of class is later on this afternoon. The first thing I will tell them is, if you do not understand the visual nature of comics, get out now, because you're going to fail this class. You cannot write comics if you do not understand the visual component of it. It can be learned, it can be taught, but if you don't know it, you are going to write the worst comics of all time. Okay, so now here's an example of what I mean. This is another two-page spread that I wrote. Uh, I tend to write a lot of two-page spreads, which makes editors and publishers very, very angry. Um, the reason it makes them angry is because most comics have ads in them, and if you write a two-page spread, they cannot place an ad there. It allows me, as the writer, and as the co-collaborator with the artist to totally control the pace of a scene as much as humanly possible. Um, I've been yelled at for using two-page spreads. I have never not, I've never caved. Every single time I'm like, no, I'm not gonna change it. I'm not gonna change it because this scene has to be told this way. Um, hence, people don't like to work with me, but that's, I don't care. Um, <laughs> so. Here we have, this is the page, it was uh, drawn by Sanford Green, a good friend of mine, and uh, I knew Sanford was really busy, and, and Sanford has this tendency to call me up at like two in the morning and go, what the hell's going on? You've written this scene, it's got too much going on, I don't know what to do. And so with Sanford, I would always do this. <laughs> now this is obviously not well drawn, this is about the extent of my drawing ability at this point in my life. Um, but if you look at this, this right here and this right here are the exact same thing. Um, the script, I didn't even bother putting the script up, but the script broke it down the exact same way. But I, Sanford wanted an idea for angles and things like that, and so I threw it together, and, and this is what I came up with. And he responded, you're the worst artist ever, which is what, <laughs> which is what he does all the time. And we're doing another book together, and it's, it's, um, I'm used to his criticisms. Uh, but it also becomes, uh, like, going back to what I was saying about the visual component of, of comics, you, you have to understand multiple languages. You have to be able to speak multiple languages. If you're a filmmaker, um, if you're a director, you need to know a little bit about cinematography, you need to know a little bit about lighting, you need to know what you want from costume design, you need to know about acting, you need to know about all these things. Uh, same thing with comics, you need to understand a lot of this stuff. You need to understand the visual component of stories, you need to understand how color works, you need to understand these things, otherwise you're not going to make particularly good comics. Um, and here we go, sort of back to the beginning as I wrap it up and we get ready to go into Q&A. Uh, again, we just sort of see the transition. This is, this is the evolution of, of a comic book. It starts as a script, it turns into pencils, then it goes into inks, then it goes into colors, and somewhere along the line it changes. And it changes because an artist decides to add a panel or subtract a panel or something gets lost in translation. A lot of times you're working with artists that English isn't their first language and you, you know, you write in the script, he's carrying a big scary knife, and then the panel shows up and the knife looks like a werewolf, and you're like, what, the, how did this happen? And then you realize, oh, I just should have said a big knife as opposed to a scary knife, because scary isn't quite the same meaning in Croatian or whatever, whoever the artist is you're working with. Um, and then that leads me to, to what I've defined as the five rules of comics. 
And those five rules of comics, I think, apply to pretty much anything creatively that you do. And so we're going to go right over to that right now, the five C's of comics. Uh, the first, obviously, is concept. You have to have an idea slash story. And I think that it's really important that, that people understand that ideas and stories are not the same thing. Ideas are where stories come from, but stories are the evolution of ideas. And if you are not prepared to evolve your idea into a story, you're going to hit a lot of roadblocks along the way. Number two is communication. That's a combination of writing out the story, but it's also writing out the story in a way that is easily understood. When I write my scripts for comics, I am actually writing two versions of the scripts. One, I'm, part of that version is what I'm writing to the art team. It's meant for them and them only. And then the other part is what I'm writing for the reader. That's the dialogue, the narration, things like that. Collaboration, that's working with others. That's the most important part, I think, of the creative process is the collaboration. It's a good collaborative, uh, it's good to have a good collaborative team. And I think the thing that you need to understand is that collaboration is open to a very broad interpretation. If you're a painter, the person who sold you the paint at the art store and the person who made that paint and the person who made those brushes and the person who stretched those canvases, in their own way, they're your collaborators, okay? It goes very deep. It's not just necessarily your cinematographer, okay? Your collaborator is that PA who's running out and getting coffee on set. It's the assistant editor who's making sure that all of your words are spelled properly because usually the editor's spelling is as bad as your spelling. Number four, and this is very important, this is concession. This is adjusting to changes. This goes back to what I was talking about with a, panel, a page that you write with four panels, but your artist draws nine. I've had that happen. Um, you have to put your ego aside, especially in comics. A lot of it because there's never enough time to have an ego get in the way. Usually when you find out you have to make a major change, you've got maybe 24 hours, and so you just have to do it. Everything is in, is in service to the story, not to your ego. And the fifth part is connection, and that's finding your audience, which in and of itself is a complicated process. And you'll do that many ways. Part of it is through the work itself, but then part of it is going out and engaging and listening and sort of keeping your ear to the street, as it were, so that you can understand what people want. Um, and not always what they want, but sometimes what they need. And this is something that a lot of us in comics have been talking about, is what do our readers need at this point? Uh, because the industry has sort of been taken over by a very small group of rabid fans who have very limited, um, I gotta be careful how I say this. <laughs> limited views on how things should be. And they've sort of taken over the market and they control the market uh, in ways that are very dangerous and are very counterintuitive to things like diversity and inclusion. And so it's up to us as creators to figure out how to counteract that, counterbalance that. Um, because you can't always punch people in the head. It doesn't always work out that way. Um, so that's it. That's the five C's of comics. But I do believe, um, as someone who's worked in other mediums, that these five C's apply no matter what. Um, and the, the last part before we start q and I, I want to go back to, um, to what Steve was saying in the opening statements about, you know, introduce yourselves, networking, and it goes back to what I was talking about in the very beginning. Um, I met Sean here 20-something years ago. I met Scott, I don't even remember where, 20-something years ago. Um, one of my best friends I met at the Independent Feature Film Market in New York City in 1997. We were both there trying to sell a movie. Neither of us were successful in selling a movie, but we were, were now friends 20 years later. We've collaborated on film festivals. You never know who you're meeting when you're meeting them, what, they're going, what sort of role they're going to play in your life 20-something years later, 10 years later. God, in my case, it's even 30 years later. Um, those connections, that networking is going to do more for you than any of you can possibly realize. Um, it really, really has a huge impact on where you go creatively. And where you go creatively is always, and I do mean this, always determined by the company you keep. Okay? Whenever possible, 
and this will sound really just a horrific thing to say, whenever possible, try to align yourself with people who are further ahead than you are, okay? It's okay to hang out with one or two people that are at the same level you are, no more than one who's further behind than you. <laughs> and that notion of trying to lend a helping hand to someone, that's great, but you only have two hands. And if you're lending more than one helping hand, there are friends who will drag you down. The final note I will say is this. Just don't give up. I did not break into comics until I was in my 40s. I started trying to break into comics at age 16. I got, so age 16, I got my first paid gig in comics at 36. I had a whole other career in between, so it's not like I was like totally broke living off of ramen, but it took a long time. It always takes longer than you think it will. It always takes longer than you're willing to wait. The key is, and this is it, when you're filled with doubt, when you're ready to quit, when you're like, I just can't do this anymore, it's not happening, this is what you say to yourself. Yeah, maybe I'll quit tomorrow. Never quit today. And that's it. And now we got a couple minutes for uh, questions. Or like maybe one question, I guess. That's the one time it's good to procrastinate then, is yeah. when you're gonna give up, right? <laughs> yes. Very good. Let's open this up to questions for uh, David. We have just a few minutes. I have a question to start off with. That time when you uh, got out of college and you were still trying to find the beginnings of career, you said you started writing to yeah. get yourself going. What, was that your zine? Was that, were you doing contract work? Were you an independent? I was a stand-up comedian. What? I well, that kind of shows in your presentation, so. Uh, I, um, I, I never wanted to be a stand-up comedian. I wasn't particularly good at it, but when you're 22 years old and you're creative, like, you, you're a junkie, basically. You need a fix. You need feedback on your creativity. Stand-up comedy was the only thing that gave me an immediate feedback, and, um, and it honed my writing skills. And then I got to a point where I was writing these elaborate jokes that would require five people on stage to pull them off. <laughs> And, uh, and I was a panel, like, you were doing a two-page spread even then. Exactly, exactly. Um, but yeah, no, I, I actually did stand-up comedy for about three or four years. And I, I, I was never funnier than I am right now, and I wasn't that funny today, so you kind of know where I was. So. Not true, not true. Um, That's frightening. That's a frightening thing to start off doing when you're just like, well, I'll try stand-up comedy. I mean, it's not an easy thing to... It's, it's that um, when you've got that creative fire and you're young and don't know any better, you, you just, you, you take what you can get. And um, I fortunately didn't do drugs or alcohol, so I needed, I needed that like psychotic rush that, <laughs> that I don't need anymore at all, so. Any questions for David? Yes, uh, in the plaid shirt, in the black t-shirt. That's you, yep, yep. Um, I had, I had to learn how to collaborate. I wasn't very good at it. I'm an only child, so I, it means I was selfish and spoiled. Um, and with the magazine, I just didn't know who to ask. And so, you know, I, I met a couple other people along the way. Uh, my time at Willamette Week was really good at learning how to collaborate with others. And now, a lot of it's just about being, um, I don't treat collaboration like I treat dating, meaning I don't, I'm not going out of my way to be anything other than what I am. I'm not trying to impress you, and, and I, I'm like, we're gonna get the job done. And, and I'm very straightforward with my collaborators, and especially artists, and I ask them, well, I study all their art that is available, and then I ask them, well, what is it that you wanna draw? You've been drawing this for five years. Is there something different that you wanna do? And, and I'm just very open, and I tell them, just reach out to me. Um, because to me, the, the, the end goal is to produce a great comic book, not for me to look like, oh, he's so great. I, I, like, I don't need that. Um, yes, right up front here. Oh, what's been what my, is, yeah, yeah, go ahead. What's been my experience bringing diversity to comics? 
we're getting the red flashing light. It's freaking me out. I'm like Peter Brady here. Um, uh, or is it Jan Brady, I think? Yeah. Not sure which one. Uh, it's my challenge. It's my goal. It's what I become known for. Um, it's difficult because it's an uphill battle because we now live in a country where diversity is seen as the greatest evil, whereas the fight against diversity is actually the great evil. Um, so it's, you know, me not paying a lot of attention to the horrible things that are said about me on, on Twitter. Um, and, you know, but, but that's, my thing is, is comics are not that much more diverse than when I started reading them, which was over 40 years ago, and I'll be damned if I'm not going to do my best in my time here to try to put something in there. And so when I'm working with an artist, you know, and it's like there's a crowd scene, and I'm like, if I see only white people in this crowd scene in New York City, mm -hmm. you're gonna have to go back and redraw this. Very plain and simple. Um, And that's it, and it's, and, and it's, and it's actually become a, a bigger struggle than I thought it was gonna be. And, and I become pigeonholed and, and sort of tokenized, and that's the cool thing about getting to a certain age where it's like, okay, yeah, you know, I'm getting work, and I'm sort of the token guy, and it just doesn't bother me that much because I realize that my life is more than half over, and I just need to pay my bills. And so what I do is I just try to make things as, as subversive as possible so that some people get it and other people don't. But yeah, I'm, I'm definitely that right or that left wing agenda um, person that's ruining mass media in America. Yeah. So, and with that, yeah. let's give him a big round of applause and a thank you, David Walker. Thank you. When I was a kid growing up in the 70s, my grandparents, like every black household, had subscriptions to Ebony and Jet magazine. And so I would pick up these magazines, I'd read them, and I would see the images in them. And I was endlessly fascinated with all these stories about these famous actors of the time, Pam Greer, Fred Williamson, Richard Roundtree, all people like this. But they were never in the movies that I was seeing on TV or in the theaters. So I was sort of... I was aware that there was this, this other world of film. Um, and by the time I got into high school and then uh, college was the home video revolution. And, and these movies were popping up. And I, I started watching them and I realized there's this whole world of cinema that I have not been exposed to, but I, I sort of knew tangentially. And, um, but most of that world had gone away. Most of those actors weren't working anymore. I became endlessly fascinated with all of them. And I decided I wanted to make a documentary about those films and about these people. I just wanted to know what happened to them. It was my own curiosity. So I started uh, a, a documentary on black films of the 1970s. And it started with an initial amount of research, watching tons of movies. And I took notes on all these movies because I was watching five, six movies a day. And I was kind of like, okay, so what's the difference between Foxy Brown and coffee? And I would, I would write it all out. And then at some point, the film wasn't happening fast enough. And this goes back to what I've talked about in the past, about the creativity was not happening fast enough. I needed something more immediate that I could work on. And at the time, everyone was starting these zines and these small press magazine publications. And I thought, well, I can do that, and that will give me something to work on as I'm trying to get this film up and off the ground. And so that's how it started. Um, it started with me just writing these film reviews, and they were like these sort of hallucinatory, you know, uh, reviews, and, and, but it, it caught on. And back in those days, it was, it was fairly easy to get distribution. And, um, and then I started production on the film, and I took the interviews that I, you know, had done and was using those in the magazine, and before long, people just sort of knew it. it, it, it I never expected it to have a life of its own. Originally, it was just meant for me and my friends, and, and really for myself. Because again, it was like, okay, so which Fred Williamson movie is he on the train? And oh, okay, is it Death Journey or is it, yeah, and that was, that's what it was all about.